director of the John Adams Institute, and I'm very happy that we're here back at the Odeon, very beautiful space, and um, very happy that we are welcoming tonight, uh, I think, a very um, bright person who writes very daring stuff, and um, I'm very proud that we could um, have Eric Schlosser tonight here in Amsterdam. He was invited together with the John Adams Institute and the Veer Foundation in Leiden. It's a big uh, conference in Leiden today and tomorrow. But there is one big public venue in Amsterdam and he's speaking there tonight. And I'm very proud of that. Before Eric will talk about many of his work and of course his current work, um, I'm very happy to announce to you a kind of house moderator, um, very good um, um, familiar uh, face, I think, for the John Adams Institute, Jan Donkers. And he was today quoted in the Volkskrant as an American scholar, a writer, and a, brush, and a Bush criticizer. And um, I'm happy that he's here. He will, in a moment, um, give his introduction. Tonight's evening is a, is a little bit different than the usual lectures. I don't know how many of you come to these regularly. Normally, our guest of honor uh, gives a, a speech for about 30 minutes. Today, after the introduction of Jan Donkers, both gentlemen, Jan Donkers and Eric Schlosser, will sit down in the big sofas and have a large interview. There are many items and many topics they're going to discuss about, and Jan will, in a moment, introduce to, uh, you to them. Um, after the lecture, Eric promised me that he will sign books, but before that, I will be back to tell you something about our next programs. Thank you for so long, and Jan, can I ask you to take the floor? Good evening uh, on my part as well, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it was his first book, but what a debut it, debut it was. Fast Food Nation came out in 2001, and the copy I here have in my hands is the 42nd printing, and that is the British edition. The American uh, edition, in what printing it now is, we don't know. Eric Schlosser doesn't know because um, uh, he doesn't mind those statistics. He minds other statistics. Uh, but as many more, as he just said, than he had ever thought it would be. And he has no idea either how many copies it sold uh, worldwide, but they're in the, in the, in the thousands, ten thousand, dozens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, I think. Um, it is also a book that in the United States has created uh, quite an uproar, although most of the reactions were favorable. Uh, one reviewer, although that was a British one, I think, he wrote, Schlosser could do for the fast food industry what Rachel Carson's Silent Spring did for producers of pesticides. Maybe I should explain that uh, for the younger among us, and I'm glad to see that there are many of them. Uh, Rachel Carson wrote a book in the 60s about the, uh, uh, the, the ill effect uh, of what pesticides did uh, for, uh, the, uh, for agriculture and ultimately, of course, for, for, for men. Um, Mr. Schlosser is a writer for the uh, Atlantic Monthly. He has received a number of uh, journalistic honors, including uh, a, a na National Magazine Award for an earlier version of uh, Reefer Madness, uh, which uh, in book form appeared in, uh, he thinks, 2003, so we're not sure, with the subtitle and other tales from the American underground, dealing not only, uh, of course, then with Reefer Madness, but also with the uh, pornography industry and the world of uh, migrant workers in the United States. Mr. Slosser is a or was a native of New York City, now of California. He graduated from Princeton with a, a history degree, and, and then was, in his own words, uh, remarkably unsuccessful as a playwright and a fiction writer. He was convinced by friends to give uh, the lowly trade of journalism uh, a try and apparently and fortunately has never looked back. Uh, at present, Mr. Schlosser is finishing a book about the uh, American prison system that will be uh, published, but again, he is not sure, sometime next year. We will talk about several of the subjects that uh, Eric Schlosser has written about uh, and is still writing about, uh, and, and in order 
to uh, try to make this evening a, a, a bit neatly arranged, I would like to try to treat the different subjects uh, subsequently. Uh, first, I will have a few questions, then the floor, so all of you will have a chance to uh, interrogate Mr. Schlosser, and then we will move on to the next subject. You can direct your questions uh, at him uh, uh, personally. Uh, for those of you who feel uh, embarrassed to, to, to stand up in public or have other reasons uh, to prefer uh, the other... Uh, why do you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> so write your questions in uh, legibly, please, uh, uh, on a piece of paper, and uh, then uh, hand them uh, to me, um, and I will put them to Mr. Slosser. Uh, so may I invite Eric to one of these beautiful uh, chairs here on the Is this, yes, loud and clear? Uh, first of all, um, Eric, after having read uh, both of your books, um, I would like to, like to talk a bit about uh, your methods. Um, one of the reasons that your writing is uh, so uh, both convincing and accessible is that you choose uh, for a running narrative, uninterrupted, uninterrupted by notes, but that uh, in both books you add at the end a huge appendix of notes dozen pages, dozens, dozens of pages long, where you attribute the source of every statement uh, that you make, controversial or not, uh, or that other people make. Um, uh, that leads me to, to the point that, despite the heavy criticism that was launched at especially your first book, nobody has been able to find mistakes that have been sufficient reason to take you to court, which is quite amazing, considering what uh, kind of top-notch lawyers uh, these corporations uh, have access to. How, well, <clears throat> as my family would tell you, I hate to be wrong. Uh -huh. So just on a personal level, if I'm going to write about a subject, I really try to be accurate. But I was also very aware in writing Fast Food Nation that I was writing about some of the meanest, most litigious corporations in the United States who had not hesitated in the past to try, literally, legally, to destroy critics, even very modest critics of their business practices. So I love writing. I hate footnotes. Doing footnotes is the antithesis of creative work. It is a deadening, killing, anal type of work. <laughs> but I felt like uh, and we, we talked about this earlier, I felt that uh, I should show the companies I was criticizing exactly where I got everything so that they wanted to sue me, they would know legally they didn't have a case. But I also include these footnotes uh, as, a, as an act of faith with a reader mm -hmm. uh, to make my work transparent. And if someone wants to know more about a subject, they can look it up, but they can also see for themselves the ethic that went into the work. Uh, not that I have the final word and not that I actually am right about everything. Um, some mistakes were pointed out by, by readers, mm -hmm. by, by readers who, who sent me letters after it came out and I've corrected those errors. But it was very, very gratifying that the criticism of, my, of Fast Food Nation from, the, from the, the meat packing industry and the fast food industry has been very personal. Mm -hmm. Uh, they've said I'm a very bad person, and um, it's really hurt my feelings. <laughs> and they've, they've been very critical of me as a journalist, but they have not cited errors in the book. And didn't and, cost and, you any um, money either. <laughs> and thus far, they have not sued me or... And, and the, the more I've thought about it, the more how outrageous it is that a journalist should even have to worry about this because these companies wrap themselves in the American flag. They portray themselves as being more patriotic than anyone. And why shouldn't they believe in freedom? Um, as a writer, every book you write is going to be criticized 
by book critics, and some have been extremely critical of me, but writers don't generally threaten book critics with lawsuits if they don't like the book reviews. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, I won't get going on why these companies really uh, shouldn't behave this way. But you write to know it yourself. You're a one-man operation. The much, uh, although you hate it a lot, you do it yourself. Yeah. Okay. I, I, both of these books were done without a researcher of any kind. Uh, there, there was uh, some archival research on the... Uh, the Disney scientific advisor who did human experiments for the Nazis. Um, I had a researcher in the National Ar Archives help me with that, but the research and the writing and the footnotes were mine because that's what a writer's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Was that the research that, that tied in with the my friend, the our friend, the atom? Our friend, the atom, yeah. The, yes. the, the man responsible for the Disney documentary, Our Friend the Atom, was involved in uh, experiments, experiments on in concentration camp victims in yep. Dachau. And, uh, it's all in a book. Read about the it. The link it's between yeah. concentration camps <laughs> and, and Disney and World. <laughs> Mickey Mouse. It's pretty mind blowing, but it's true. Um, you started as, a, um, as an investigator reported quite late. Was that for the reasons I just mentioned, that you first wanted to be a playwright? Or, or I started out as a playwright. Um, I was unsuccessful. I was unsuccessful as a novelist. I had the beginnings of a screenwriting career and had sold my first screenplay to a very good film company. But I saw how writers were treated by the film world in the United States, and I wanted control over my words. And I had friends who were journalists who persuaded me to try. And I was very, very fortunate that the Atlantic Monthly Magazine, and un unfortunately now the outgoing editor of the Atlantic Monthly, reads unsolicited query letters every week. So I sent an article proposal to the magazine, and the top editor read it and said, no thanks, but try again. And I tried again. And with I got the same a, article? Uh, with a different one, a different one. Um, and uh, it was published, a very, very short article, and that led to a major uh, assignment to do the marijuana investigation. And that's when I quit my day job for the film company and just became a journalist. And, and I've been remarkably fortunate to work with editors who are truly independent. And I think it's significant that both uh, my work for the Atlantic Monthly and for Rolling Stone both of those are independently owned magazines. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Rolling Stone, when I did Fast Food Nation for Rolling Stone, Jan Winner, who's the editor, also owns it. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, it's telling that these independent media have been far, far more courageous in what they publish than the corporate-owned media. And in fact, when, when I tried to do Fast Food Nation as a book, it was turned down by all the major corporate publishing houses uh, in New York and it was published by Houghton Mifflin, the last major independent uh, publishing house and based in Boston. So I've been very, very fortunate to find editors willing to support the kind of investigative you know, reporting I do. And those sorts of editors are, are really rare these days in the United States. Um, d just a question in between uh, what I was wanting to add. Independent reporting and independent publishing is in decline in the United States. Do you see that decline going on, or you're an optimist? You always say and write. I am. I, I see a continued decline uh, in the five years since Fast Food Nation has been published. Um, the number of independent bookstores continues to decline. Uh, I've made a point of doing book readings at independent bookstores, and some of my favorite stores that I've visited all over the United States have closed. Uh, and the media is getting bigger and bigger and more centralized. Uh, what's encouraging is that the corporate media is learning that you can earn money selling nonconformist books. <laughs> and so uh, my, the paperback version of, of Fast Food Nation is published in the United States by Rupert Murdoch's <laughs> publishing company. And probably, I mean, you mentioned the fact that I don't know how many copies have been sold, and that's true, but I can tell you that Rupert Murdoch has made more money off of Fast Food Nation than any <laughs> other individual by far. And that's the, that's the nature of the system, and 
Because he looks at the bottom line. That's, that's it's about the bottom line, yeah. and and <laughs> Fast Food Nation was published, I think, at a very, a very good moment uh, for this sort of work. It was published in January of 2001, as George W. Bush was taking office, not being elected, but taking, taking office. office. Yes. And I think that part of its success is it was a book that was iconoclastic that was challenging conventional wisdom and the power structure. And the, the great success of the book, which I'm not attributing to the eloquence of my prose, but for whatever reason and the timing, has made it much easier for other authors to get books published that similarly challenge the way things are. And like been, Barbara Ehrenreich, like for Barbara instance. Barbara Ehrenreich's book came out, I believe, uh, later that year. And Michael Moore's book, uh, a year later, and, um, and uh, uh, Greg Pallas, The Best yes. Democracy That yes. Money Can Buy. Yes. So, so if you look at um, the structure of the media itself, it's very dis discouraging. But if you look at the books that are being published, the films that are now being made, uh, there is a counterculture emerging in the United States. And I think that, especially on, on university campuses, there are a set of attitudes forming and strengthening that you haven't seen in America in 25 or 30 years. I'd like to get back to that optimism later on, maybe yeah. because I I'm, I'm don't share it wholeheartedly, but then I'm not an American. So. Um, and Americans are supposed to be optimistic. Well, Big, I'm also a New Yorker, so that, <laughs> that, that, that gives a, a lot of uh, grounds for dour <laughs> pessimism. There's a very Dark street but then you York chose California culture. as your new new country, and, and California is the country of eternal opportunities. So well, I, there there were many reasons for that choice, but one of them is that I'm I'm writing a book on prisons yes. now. We'll and get aside to that from, also. Uh -huh. Aside from what was best for our children and and my wife, as a, who's a painter, um, I am visiting some of the darkest, most depressing places that I've ever seen. Certainly, I find it much easier to go into a slaughterhouse than to go into a prison. The prisons are the worst things I've ever seen in American society, and so I'm living in a remarkably beautiful place to counter, counterbalance that. Um, I've been trying hard, uh, reading your, 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 both of your books, to find a common denominator uh, among the subjects that you tackle. Um, it's not easy. Is it, it is what drives you? Is it the interest in in uh, unbridled corporate power? Um, is it the double morality, double standard of American society? Is it the rhetoric of the free market, or is it a bit of all of these, or or is it maybe what you mentioned? I think in one interview, uh, the legacy of the '60s that uh, that that one could argue. Uh, marks the birth of uh, America's addiction to drugs, to happy meals, <laughs> and to pornography. That this is a, yeah, a, a, well, I, a I long question, there's, there's I, I realize well, No, 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 now, but so. there's, two, there's, there's two simple answers that okay. I can then expound upon. Uh, the first thing that drives me is curiosity. And for every subject, I write about uh, even marijuana and pornography. I begin with the remarkable amounts of ignorance. I really don't know very much about uh, these subjects when I begin the investigation. So in some ways, I'm like a perpetual student. And I'm curious about what's going on. And particularly, I'm curious about the difference between the reality and what we're being told is the reality, the, the, the truth and what is being marketed and peddled and sold is the truth. So, so there's a curiosity and there's a kind of iconoclasm that the real story isn't being told. Mm -hmm. And what's unfortunate is, you know, my background in American history, you know, repeatedly taught me that what people were being told at the time wasn't what was happening. So there, there's that innate suspicion. But really, if you look at the two books that have been published and the one I'm working right now, in a very simple sense, they're about what has happened to my country. And it's happened in my lifetime. And the, the, the 
the years that all three books cover are almost identical. The, the, the heart of each one of these books covers a period maybe from the early 70s to the present day in which profound changes happened in the United States, which I have witnessed, and the country that I knew as a child has become something completely different. And how did that happen? What is happening? What does that mean? Um, that's what I'm writing about. So mm -hmm. in a way, I'm, I'm trying to write a kind of alternative history to what the mainstream media is feeding people every day. Mm -hmm. Well, t t talking about, about that, but then again coming back to your methods, uh, you're writing alternative history and you're writing about um, how your country has changed. Several other uh, writers do the same. Um, but some reviewers have commented on the tone of your, their work, and they, they have uh, commented that you do not phrase your criticism in a belligerent way. Uh, um, you, you're not a, not a crusader, not, not, but you, you're, you're someone who, who quietly lays the facts on the table. Uh, somebody wrote, uh, you're Michael Moore without the bullhorn, and you're Hunter Thompson without the drugs. So is that, uh, uh, but yet in a way, but that's not, I mean, yeah. that's supposed to be a compliment. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I think it's a compliment, yeah. yes. But, but, but in a way, you are in the tradition of the great muckrakers uh, that operated between the, the two uh, great wars in the United States. And that's still, uh, no, no, not still, I shouldn't say that, but at that time had a huge impact on, 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 on American society. As well, Ra uh, Rachel Carson, Carson had, and as you probably Well, I, I wouldn't claim any great impact of my work. And there are writers whom I enormously admire whose writing style is completely different from mine. Uh, one of them would be Hunter Thompson. He is one of my favorite American writers of nonfiction, and his writing style is the antithesis of mine. Yes. Um, <laughs> and he makes himself so present on every single page that he ultimately becomes invisible and it's really not about him. Unfortunately, his journalism has been imitated so often in the United States and done, I think, inadequately. It so, cannot so, be being imitated. So in a way, yeah. I, I, I made a deliberate choice in how I decided to do nonfiction in many ways in rebellion against the celebrity-obsessed, uh, narcissistic, journalism that I, that I was reading in which the writer's you know, exploits were the real focus of attention, whereas I felt like the subject matter was what was most interesting. But, but beyond that, the fiction, a lot of the fiction that I loved is fiction that you know, used certain techniques in which the, author, uh, the author's voice was invisible. Mm -hmm. And I've just chosen in nonfiction to take people who are cut off from the mainstream, people who don't have access to the media, whether they are drug dealers or migrant farm workers or slaughterhouse workers or now prisoners, mm -hmm. and put their voices before mine and, and get out of the way. And if you were to have a longer dinner with me, you would find that I can be very opinionated and mm -hmm. rant and rave, and it's very... <laughs> satisfying to do in the moment, but I think the truth speaks for itself. So I, I, try, to, I try to achieve, and I don't want to sound too new age, but I, I try to achieve a stillness and allow these voices center stage and to get out of the way. And I, I, ultimately I'm present because I'm choosing the quotes and I'm choosing the structure and it's not as though hopefully I'm completely invisible, but it's a, it's a way of putting the song before the singer. Uh-huh. And the ranting and raving can be counterproductive, so let them take well, the stage. Well, I think that people in good faith can disagree. Uh -huh. And I, there are friends of mine who are so right-wing, it's beyond belief, and they're lovely people. <laughs> and I have gotten to meet some very prominent, very left-wing people who you would think I would agree with more politically, and they are miserable human beings. So I, I've tried to write in a style that is open 
to anyone who wants to mm -hmm. be exposed to it. And then they can agree with me or disagree with me or love it or hate it, but I'm, I'm not going to put myself before the real point, which is, again, mm -hmm. what the hell has happened to my country? Shall we talk a, a, a bit more in depth about uh, your first book about Fast Food Nation? Sure. Uh, there are several tr uh, trends that uh, cause uh, concern, uh, to say it mildly, uh, add up to the, uh, the grim picture that you paint in this, books, in this book. Um, the relaxing of the OSHA standards, uh, the corporate takeover not only of food programs in schools, but by implication their textbook material in schools um, uh, with their philosophy uh, implied in that. Um, the uh, acute risks of dangerous outbreaks of diseases, the origins of which are, are increasingly uh, difficult to trace. Um, the circumvention of the minimal wage by hiring teenagers, for instance, and by hiring illegal immigrants. And last but not least, uh, the epitome of obesity that costs thousands of lives, but also billions of tax dollars, which Americans should be uh, vulnerable to, to that argument. Now, which trends do I forget? Uh, gosh, the, the, the trend toward uh, manufacturing the taste of food in chemical plants in New Jersey. Well, that was a wonderful <laughs> subject, uh, a wonderful chapter. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, um, but is that so scary? That, well, yeah. I mean, compared to, to the, 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 the things that no, I mentioned and no. to the horrible things no. that we do to animals? Uh, no, uh, I, I was being flippant. Um, <laughs> the book is about fast food and about this industry and also not. It's using this industry literally as a subject of investigation, but also as a metaphor and as a symbol in many ways of these sorts of changes. Mm -hmm. And so some of the themes, some of the central themes would be, uh, you know, the incredible drive towards conformity, mm -hmm. of wiping out uh, independence economically, but also wiping out uh, contrary points of view that have gone on in the United States. Uh, absolutely the centralization and industrialization of our food system, but also the incredible rise of corporate power. And that corporate power has many manifestations. It, it has manifestations in the way that companies are able to exploit farmers and ranchers or exploit workers or control food safety laws that are meant to control them. So there are many variations of this basic theme, but I think um, you could write the same book and write it about you know, a dozen other American industries. Mm -hmm. There was something about the fast food industry that was, that was particularly useful. And firstly, it's food. Uh, secondly, it's, it's, it's something, not just a fundamental commodity, but one that has been so marketed to us that we're, we're more aware of it than we would be necessarily of the manufacturers of steel ingots. So the book is about Hopefully it works on two levels. It works on the, on the ostensible level. This is an exploration of the fast food industry. Mm -hmm. But hopefully it raises questions about the bigger subject, which is America, mm -hmm. Inc. Well, I, I'll, I'll get to, to some of these uh, trends that I mentioned uh, later on. But, uh, and I mentioned only in passing that um, that's the, uh, I, th I think, the horrible and immoral things we do to animals. Some of the grimmest scenes uh, in your book uh, deal with uh, you uh, visiting and describing the slaughterhouses and the uh, meat packing plants. Did you become, become a vegetarian after visiting those? No, no? I didn't. Uh, but I thought about it <laughs> a lot. So and does, there are, so there are very, people, very yeah. strong moral ethical, environmental arguments for being a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. uh, the animals that I saw, the cattle I saw being slaughtered were being terribly mistreated. Uh, I saw a couple of uh, cattle uh, dismembered while still conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, but what really stayed with me from my visits to these meatpacking uh, communities was not the violence and the blood and the gore of what is happening to the animals, 
but the horrible injuries and the poverty of the workers. So the thoughts that come back to me are not of the gore of the slaughterhouse. The thoughts that recur in my mind are sitting in the trailer of a worker at night who's been injured, has lost his job, is a manual laborer, never able to do manual labor again, that sort of human uh, exploitation and injustice is, is what really stays with me. And in many ways, for me, it's the most important part of the book. And the book has been deliberately structured so that you reach those chapter, that chapter at the crucial moment mm -hmm. in the narrative of the book. Yes. It's also perhaps the most difficult issue uh, to get anyone to care about in the United States. Uh, you mean people care more about animal welfare than about the welfare of There is absolutely illegal. no question, and, I, and I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of animal rights. Mm -hmm. uh, the animal rights groups in the United States, particular, particularly PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, mm -hmm. is remarkably well organized well-funded, incredibly effective, and brilliant at what they do as mm -hmm. an activist group. And there is nothing approaching PETA uh, that works uh, on behalf of human beings. And I've, I've, I've contacted animal rights groups and said, I will work with you if you will campaign on behalf of the two-legged animals as well as the four-legged animals. And there is most of the people, and again, I'm not putting down the animal rights movement at all, because animals, if you were to visit the industrial farms of the United States, and not just the cattle feedlots, where 100,000 cattle are crammed into these pens, but the, the, in some ways, the hog factories are even worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, hogs are incredibly intelligent animals. They're smarter than dogs. They have a rich emotional life, they're, they're very affectionate towards one another and towards people, mm -hmm. and they are being crammed together so tightly that their tails are being cut off so that they won't bite and one another. I mean, it's tail. horrible. Yeah, yeah. So I have great empathy for animal rights, but the animal rights organizations are primarily uh, funded and run by upper middle class, well-educated people who for whatever reason find it easier to have empathy for animals than for the underclass of America. Talking and, about and, and I, I really believe, and then I'll, I'll finish this rant, um, <laughs> if the slaughterhouse workers in the United States today were blonde-haired and blue-eyed, there is no way they could be exploited and injured and discarded the way they are. And the fact that they are immigrants and recent immigrants and illegal immigrants and non-English speaking uh, makes them all but invisible to the mainstream. You, you write a, a chapter in, in, in Reaver Madness, your, check, your second book about uh, illegal workers in the uh, California strawberry fields. Uh, but in this book, the, your first book, you, you, you write about a disturbing uh, trend of how more and more, as you, as you say, uh, undocumented aliens are working in these uh, 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 meatpacking plants, slaughterhouses. Um, illiterate, unorganized, not aware of the situation, sometimes even not knowing where they are. Um, one of the most gripping scenes um, in your book is the one where you describe how one worker um, who has l just lost both his hands in a, in a cutter is forced to write his signature with his mouth on a form that releases the company from any medical uh, uh, the, expenditure. The, the injured, the worker had had both hands crushed, not lost, but uh, okay. completely disabled. And this meatpacking company operating in Texas. My Texas, favorite state. Texas is the only state in the United States where a company does not have to participate in a workman's comp compensation scheme. And this meatpacking company was out of the workers' compensation system. And if a, if a worker was injured at the plant, they were immediately presented with a piece of paper. If they signed the piece of paper, their medical care would be 
taken over by the company for the rest of their life, and they had no legal right to challenge any of the medical decisions made by the company. Uh, if they did not sign the piece of paper, they could be fired on the spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, with immigrant workforce barely aware of the law, the, the pressure to sign these pieces of paper is enormous, and there are people at the company whose only job it is to get workers to sign. And in this instance, uh, this company representative had persuaded an injured worker to sign a release form with a pen held in his teeth because he could not write with either hand. But in this case, uh, that signature was ruled invalid by the court, not because it was signed with his teeth, but because he was in a hospital emergency room and had already been so heavily drugged when he was persuaded to sign that he was considered non compass mentis. Non -compass mentis. And I mean, this is, this is like out of Dickens. And, <laughs> and, and again, I mean, I, oh, I oh. could not write that unless it were true. And, and there's, a, there's a, a fact checker that I hired from the New Yorker to go over everything I write and challenge it and make sure it's true. He's a lovely, lovely person, and he worked on both books. And, and every now and then, I, I, I want him to tell me it's not true. Or we'll look at one another, and we just cannot believe that it's actually true. And that, that's the sort of thing that you just you can't believe it's true, and it's, it's but true. But a, a, a lot of your book, uh, especially that book, mm -hmm. is just like out of Dickens, and just like out of St. Clair Lewis. And so this has been going on uh, and has been getting worse, in my opinion, for uh, decades. And yet you are an optimist. Well, Basically. okay. I, 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 again, I come back to my study of American history. And the, the writer you mentioned, Upton Sinclair. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Okay. Upton, yeah, I'm sorry. It's so, a common I was mistake. Upton Sinclair, Sinclair yeah, yeah. wrote The Jungle a yeah. hundred years ago this coming February. It's about to be the hundredth anniversary. Mm -hmm. Conditions were worse than they are now. And we had child labor in the United States. We had no limit on how many hours an employer could work their employees, typically 10, 12 hours a day, six days a week. You know, child labor, no limit on what corporations could sell in the marketplace. But things did get better. Things got remarkably, remarkably. For a while. Well, no, and, and, and my optimism is based on the study of American history, which shows that we have periods of extraordinary greed and avarice and exploitation. And there are also periods in American history of remarkable idealism and compassion and a sense that, yes, making money is important. And yes, we all want to get ahead. But no, we will not see anyone left behind. Mm -hmm. So I don't take, uh, and I, if I were not optimistic, there is no way I could write this book on prisons. This book, this subject is so bleak and unbelievable, but if, if you believe in various theories of inevitability, there's no point in being optimistic because there's nothing you can do to change events. But if you don't believe in theories of inevitability, and when I was studying history, I read all of them, and all the various Marxists, and all the various religious, and all the Hegelian theories of some great idea being worked out. And I came to the conclusion there is no plan. Nothing inevitable is being worked out. And if something isn't inevitable, it means it doesn't have to be the way it is. If things are not inevitable, it doesn't have to be the way they are, and the power that people have to change their lives is inspiring to me. And I could tell you, if you're feeling down and you want a perky little rant about all the extraordinary changes for the good that have occurred in my lifetime. When I was born, African Americans had to use separate bathrooms, use separate mm -hmm. bus seats, couldn't sit in the same sections of, th of theaters, I don't agree with a single thing that Condoleezza Rice believes. But she's an African-American woman who's mm -hmm. the third most powerful official. So that's for better. I mean, mm -hmm. apartheid is gone. The Soviet Union is gone. And these things didn't happen. People made them happen. And I, so, I, I, and so it's, it's looking at history. It's looking at the success 
of other social movements that makes me optimistic. I agree with you that there is no plan. There is no plan from high above. Um, but um, the pendulum, pendulum will have to swing the other way pretty fast. Because if you describe that what happened since the t uh, day you were born, uh, actual minimum wage in the United States has gone down since the years when you were born by... Uh, since the uh, 70s, have uh, gone down. Yeah, since the 70s. And since when I was born, absolutely. By uh, approximately 30 or 40 percent. 40 percent. So people, hardworking people, uh, the hardworking people that America, the American myth is built on, the American dream is built on, they no longer can uh, uh, earn a decent wage. I don't, I don't disagree with that. And one of the reasons I'm so interested in Upton Sinclair right now, and I'm rereading his books, and I, I hope to write something about him, is the analogies between the late 1890s and today in the United States are quite striking. The concentration of economic power, the widening gulf between the wealthy and the poor. I mean, the gulf between the rich and the poor has not been this wide in the United States since the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And I can sit here for hours and tell you about the social problems in the United States, the injustice in the United States. It's not academic for me. I've seen it. I'm still continuing yes. to go into prisons. The people in our prisons are the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, when Reagan was elected, the new housing policy for the poor was prisons. Mm -hmm. We stopped building low-income housing, we started building prisons. Uh, the mentally Ill, Ill are in the prisons, uh, the minorities are in the prisons. So I can tell you from first-hand experience how bad things are, but that doesn't mean they're irreversibly bad. Of course and, not. And, and if you look oh. at the 19, if you look at the 1950s in the United States, we had a conservative, pro-business Republican president who was later ridiculed, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, was later ridiculed in the 60s as being the symbol of conformity and conformism and dullness, but, you know, we had the highest proportion of labor union membership. We had a graduated income tax. Uh, one of the first things that Eisenhower did upon taking office was to file an antitrust Mm -hmm. suit against the oil companies. Mm -hmm. but one of the last things he did was to warn the dangers of the military-industrial industrial complex. complex. So yes. there is a but there is a there is a, there is a, there, is a there is a strand of American conservatism that's actually quite admirable. What we have right now is a radicalism. We have mm -hmm. a radical government in mm -hmm. power, and I would argue the government in power in the United States is a radical government that is out of step with the mainstream of American history. Why do, did they vote for him again, then, if he's out of step? Boy, that's a, that's a long subject. I, I would have to well, say... Let, well, no, no, no. Well, no, no, a, a no. simple one, the very simple one word would be fear. Because and another Pearl word, Rove two words would be fear and propaganda. Uh, mm -hmm. this, is, this is not only a very radical government, but it's one of the most effective yes. at propaganda and one of the most effective at the manipulation of the media and the manipulation of facts um, that we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Well, let's not go into my pet project because that's... Then we can both just rant. <laughs> <laughs> People won't like that. No. <laughs> um, uh, just a, a couple of short questions about a uh, 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 fast, uh, fast food nation, then maybe the floor will have some question about it. You situate, uh, you situate most of, of your research in, in America's heartland, uh, the Mountain West, in Arizona. Why there? Because the rhetoric of the free market that is no longer a free market is still strongest there, or, f or other reasons? Well, I think that, you know, in the same way you could write the same book about a different industry in America and find a lot of the same phenomena, I think you could probably take a dart and throw it at the map of the United States and write about the effect of the fast food industry on just about any city, any suburb, any rural area. Colorado appealed to me for a number of reasons. Uh, in many ways, culturally, Colorado is today what California was in the 50s and early 60s. It's it's at the cutting edge of the zeitgeist. It's the bellwether. And the fact that Colorado Springs, where I chose to write, is the heart of the religious 
Right. And again, this was before Bush was elected. Um, so I don't say I have some great ability to predict the future, but I felt like this far right uh, religious right was significant, and this was the capital. Mm -hmm. uh, Colorado is also a ranching state. Yes. Uh, it has meat packing plants. It's not that far away from um, uh, the potato fields of I Idaho. And I could see happening in Colorado, simply to the landscape, uh, the recreation of Southern California and the kind of sprawl where the all fast this, food this industry this you know, came out of. Yes. It, it was like Southern California being lifted out of California and transplanted. Uh, to the foothills and the plains of, mm -hmm. of Colorado. And so there were many parts of it that thematically seemed right. But when I originally started to do this, uh, the editors at Rolling Stone were pushing me to set it at Orlando, in Orlando, which is also a very fast-growing city. But the connection with Disney was just mm. made it too freaky a place, even for me. So I, they have stronger... I couldn't, I couldn't bear the thought of spending... Also, they have better lawyers, probably. Or yeah. <laughs> Um, you, you said that you were not strong on statistics about your own book, but you are strong on statistics about my life. About, about <laughs> I've forgotten most of my life, but I can tell you a fair amount of agricultural. How many statistics. corporations control the, the potato supply now in the United States? It, it's really three. It was four, and they control eighty to ninety percent of the processed potatoes. How many control the beef industry? There are three major, major meatpacking companies, but four companies control about 80 to 85 percent of the market. And, and oddly enough, that's a greater control of the market than when Upton Sinclair was writing about the Beef Trust, which was uh, the mighty economic mm -hmm. power yeah, of his yeah, day. Yeah. And how many control the chicken industry? There are more. There are five or six. Five? But, wow. But, but what's interesting is there is now one company and, and this is since Fast Food Nation was published, uh, Tyson Foods, which is the biggest meatpacking company in the history of the world. Uh, they slaughter the most chicken, the most cattle, uh, the most hogs of anyone ever in human history. And they are a very, very tough, very mean company. I, the reason I ask this is because one of the saddest uh, um, effects of all these things you describe in this book is the quiet, or not so quiet uh, for some people, disappearance of the American farmer. Yeah. And uh, there's one particularly haunting episode in, in which you describe a farmer who you meet f uh, during your research and uh, who later committed suicide yeah. because he was no longer uh, up to the forces that he had to cope with. Is that... It, it, it was such a... You know, I mean, when you, you write it very, very... You, write, I mean, you hmm. can detect your screenwriting hmm. uh, 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 schooling in that because you... Or playwright. Uh, playwrights, because you, 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 you dose that, that, that uh, uh, chapter very, very effectively, because you describe his death afterwards. What I, what I was trying to do in that chapter was somehow recreate for the reader the feeling I had when I called his house to go out to dinner mm -hmm. and was told that he had committed suicide a few weeks earlier. And it stunned me. It absolutely stunned me. This would be the last person that I would ever, ever expect would take his own life. As a matter of fact, and I say it in the chapter, I really thought this would be a great future leader, political leader. He was able to bridge so many competing worlds in Colorado and bring together around the table so many disparate groups who normally are enemies. He was an extraordinary mm -hmm. person. So the way that that chapter is structured is a way to somehow make the reader feel the shock yes. the way that I did. And, and if I had if I had started out with a suicide, yeah. then it would not have the same, the same feeling. But he was an incredible person. One of the things that you read in your chapter about the potato industry uh, is, uh, which is less dramatic, than, of course, than the animal, uh, the, the treatment of animals, but n no less effective, is uh, in unmasking the, 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 the myth of free enterprise, 
how <coughs> the potato industry, which, as you said, is in the hands of three corporations or four, yeah. um, can unload so-called captive supplies <coughs> of potatoes. And we're mm. talking about millions of mm. tons of potatoes now. At moments when the prices are getting uh, one penny higher for yeah. the farmers that are not into the deal. And the cattle industry in particular does that mm. as well uh, by flooding the market. I mean, one of the big themes of the book is about during the very years when the free market rhetoric was at its height, freedom was being extinguished in one market after another in the mm -hmm. United States. And you know, when the United States was founded, the symbol of freedom and democracy was the independent farmer. Mm -hmm. And later, you know, with a Western myth, the independent rancher. Those are the <coughs> national icons and uh, the icons of freedom who, you know, losing their freedom in the name of freedom. It's very Orwellian. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and also, um, talking about doublespeak, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, uh, that, that's the, 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 the rhetoric that's perpetuated by uh, the current well, junta. Well, no, I'll take that back, the, yeah. the, uh, the government. Well, the double, the double speak. Well, that's what, the, what I was talking. The about double the speak is from the very top of the government, uh, you know, with the language that they use, through all the public relations firms that work very closely, not only with the Republican Party, but with these major corporations. I mean, one of the leading organizations that attacks me personally, and we spoke at dinner about how uh, the representatives of the fast food chains and of the meatpacking companies will never appear in any public forum to debate any of these issues. They will never appear on any television show, and, and a Canadian show I did, I loved what they did. They, they, they presented me and then they said, and we're gonna read you a list of the groups that we contacted for the other point of view, and they read every fast food company, they read every meatpacking company, and then said, and none of them would agree to appear. But uh, I'm getting at, uh, the group that attacks me most frequently is, couldn't be more Orwellian. The, the group is called, and you'll see them in the United States on television very often, they're called the Center for Consumer Freedom. It sounds great. Yes. And it sounds like a consumer group. I could be a member. The Center for Consumer Freedom is funded by the fast food industry, the meatpacking industry, the tobacco industry, and the alcohol industry. And they are they have nothing to do with consumers, but, mm -hmm. but the way in which the media is manipulated, when one of their representatives is on TV, you think, ah, freedom, that's good. Consumers, hey, I'm one of them. The, the point I was getting at was that, that, one of the, that other uh, 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 point of rhetoric that I find very striking uh, is the one that is, uh, as I said, perpetuated by the, the, this administration, but also previous administrations, about the importance uh, to the American economy and the American way of life of small businesses. But at the same time, uh, small businesses are appearing very, very rapidly. Um, and those that remain, usually as franchises, as you, as you described, are very heavily subsidized by the same federal government that they despise. Yeah. So, no more big government. Uh, you, that, that's the, the mantra that yeah. you that you saw. How, 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 how can they get away with that? If you go to New York City and you're on Fifth Avenue, any day of the week, you'll see uh, people with a card table doing a shell game. And Maybe you should explain what a shell a game is. A shell game is someone is standing there with a card table, and traditionally there'll be a ball, and there'll be three shells, and he'll shift around the shells, and if you could pick the shell with a ball, balaki, balaki, just you get the yeah. money. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And somehow, the guy playing the shell game always winds up with the money. Of course. That's exactly what's been going on in the United States with the relationship between business and government for the last 25 years. And it's a shell game. And there is an enormous amount of talk about the free market and an enormous amount of talk uh, about getting rid of big government. And yet government has become more powerful and has had more power over people's lives in the last 20 years 
uh, than ever before in my lifetime. And there are multiple billions of dollars going from taxpayers to the government and directly to corporations without any intervening force. Whether you, it, and you're, it's not even whether you're talking about Halliburton, which is the most obvious example, but uh, in looking at prison construction, uh, the prison industrial complex, in looking at the defense industry, and these sorts of economic arrangements have nothing to do with the free market. Nope. As a matter of fact, they are the violation of the free market. And um, so, again, there is, a, there is a huge, huge gulf between the rhetoric of freedom and the reality. Um, we have not yet touched on one of the most uh, dangerous aspects of what you described, that there is shit in the meat. Yeah. But maybe we should talk, get to that later. Uh, <laughs> after, maybe by now, uh, it's time to uh, you people on the floor to ask a question. Um, but, but first, let me make one point, and, and I'm not joking. I, I, I um, um, encouraged uh, the organization, uh, the John Adams Institute, to uh, have somebody from the fast food industry to be present tonight. Uh, is there somebody present tonight who would uh, uh, ask a question to Mr. Schlosser? Uh, uh, he, he or she need not identify him or herself, and you can ask your question later. So. Okay. Now, the first question, please. Can you, is it possible to step up to the mic? Sorry, short Canadian rather than tall Dutch. Hmm. Um, first of all, I have to say that I've enjoyed all of your books and I'm really, really pleased to be here. I, I have an, a plethora of questions, obviously, but I'm going to hopefully sneak in a couple through the evening. The first one, though, I have to say is you, you gave a sort of vague outline of why you actually felt compelled to write these books. However, I'm wondering, was there something that made you angry that said, you know, screw you, I'm doing this? What, was there that point? Uh, you know, there's, there's different levels of engagement or interest in a subject. And if it had only been that there are flavor factories that are making the taste of your food, I don't know that I would have devoted three years to it. Uh, it was, if there was something that really crystallized in my mind that this was important and worth reading about, it was my visit to meatpacking communities and the, the essay on f migrant farm workers I had actually done before that. And when I found in these meatpacking communities the same workforce that I had seen and I had met in the fields of California, it seemed to me that something significant was happening, that this sort of exploitation was new and it was really important to write about. And I even met in rural Nebraska, in the middle of nowhere in this meatpacking town, uh, someone who had picked strawberries at some of the farms I had visited uh, in California. And that just brought the story home enormously. And I had thought that being a migrant farm worker was the worst possible job in the United States, and, and the workers being the most exploited. But I think that being a meatpacking worker is actually worse. It's somewhat higher paid, but it's actually worse. But, so you, but you've never done that job. There, there, there isn't I've never a done personal either. thing that has said to you, this makes me angry. I watched my cousin do this, or I no. saw the girl down the street. No, so it was very much a cerebral attachment to the topic. And, well, and not, I, not cerebral, but visceral. And I, and I would argue that that shouldn't be so strange. No, not at and, all. And there, be, there have been periods in American history when that's what writers are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And there are dozens and dozens of writers doing it because that's the role of the writer in society. And not just, not just in nonfiction, but also in fiction. Sure. And a fiction that is engaged with the great subjects of the day. So I think. 
And I don't mean this is what you're doing, but sometimes I've asked similar kinds of questions in the United States, and it's as though there's a Martian in the midst, and I'm the Martian, and what I'm doing is so odd, whereas to me, it's just a very traditional kind of obligation, sure. not just of a writer, because if you, may, if you consider it the obligation of the writer, you're just putting it aside. It's the obligation of everyone in society Well, actually, to have that. I, I think you're an exemplar for all of us, and well, most you. especially for me as a journalist. So um, I, I'm in no way no, trying no, no, to I, criticize I didn't it, but, take I, it that but way. I appreciate what you're saying. There was but, no personal... But I have to say that you've made me quite brave in mm. taking certain steps. And, and, and the reason is that I've realized that the fact is, get your facts straight and nobody can say anything about it. So in essence, um, are you not the Reuben of the journalist um, society in that, it, Reuben, I'm sorry, Reuben, Reuben Stobner? Uh, in, in a sense, he had his facts straight and nobody could take him to court. And I, in a sense, think that you are well, a little bit of that <laughs> in the journalist society and that you have got your facts straight. So some, there are a lot of people, I'm sure, who would like to say, oh, no, 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 no. But you got your tax I'm going to have to think about mind. that yeah. comparison a little bit. <laughs> I, 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 do, I, do, I would love to hear your comment on that, but I, I'll, I'll leave you for now. But I will certainly have some more questions if I have the opportunity. Yes, we will. We'll get to, we'll get to um, the uh, to the prison industry I would say and to uh, yeah. Maybe I, I, we should explain. I just want, just yes, who uh, Ruben Sturman? Uh, the first part of the question. Uh, I would say to other writers, it's good to get your facts straight because your facts should be straight. And when you write about other people, you can never be perfect, but you should do everything you can to be right. You owe that to your subjects. And the fact that that might prevent you from being completely destroyed by a lawsuit helps too. <laughs> Thank you. And about the comparison <laughs> to Reuben Sturman, who was the founding father of America's pornography industry. I'm just going to have to think about that a little more. <laughs> We've been called versus journalists, yeah, though, haven't you. we? Yes. He, did, he didn't set out to get rich. Uh, he, he set out to tell the truth. Maybe that's a big difference. Um, one or two other questions from the floor, please. Yes. Could you, is it possible to step up to the mic? And please uh, limit your questions to fast food nation related subjects, because we will get to other subjects later on. Uh, I'm very glad you're optimistic um, and can find optimism, but um, personally one of the things that I'm not optimistic about is um, the potential that there's electoral fraud going on in the United States on some level, that that makes the uh, chance for reform more difficult than perhaps it was in prior generations. And I was curious if you had a take on that, because if in fact uh, there is some amount of voter fraud going on in the U.S., <laughs> then the opportunity for the people to change things is, is less possible than in prior generations. So do you have any thoughts well, on that? Well, there are different levels of electoral fraud and different categories of electoral fraud. Uh, the most obvious category of electoral fraud would be a voting machines being tampered with so that the results are predetermined or ballots being thrown out because the people uh, who are being voted for are, are on those ballots are not the ones that the powers that be want to be elected. Um, I'm, I have no evidence that voting machines have been delivered, deliberately tampered with, although I'm concerned about that. There absolutely was voter fraud during the 2000 uh, presidential election. I did an investigative piece for Rolling Stone. Had the votes been fully counted in the state of Florida, there would have been a different president. Um, the, but there are other kinds of voter fraud that are less obvious that, and in some ways are more concerning to me. Uh, right now, one out of eight African American men in the United States is forbidden to vote because one out of every eight African American men has a felony record that has required their vote permanently, in many cases, to be taken away from them. That's a significant part of the electorate that would not be voting for the powers that be. Uh, and what happened uh, in the state of Texas is tantamount to voter fraud. And what that is is the redistricting 
uh, the redrawing of the voter districts in Texas. And if you see a map of the voting districts in Texas right now, it's an absolute joke. These districts curve and wind and widen and shorten. And this was done at the behest of the former majority leader, Tom DeLay, uh, in order to redraw the districts of Texas to ensure that only Republican candidates for Congress could be elected. Now, this sort of, it's called gerrymandering, has been going on in the United States for centuries, for, 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 for two centuries. Since Jerry. And, pardon me? Since Jerry. And, and okay. voter fraud has been going on in the United States since at least early in the 19th century. So these are not new phenomena. I'm, I'm actually much more concerned about the control of the mainstream media and the effectiveness of the right-wing propaganda machine. I think those are more concerning to me than actual voter fraud in terms of how power will be maintained. You mean also in the sense that the major media uh, refuse to comment, to re report on, on, on uh, possible photo fraud as it happened last year in Ohio, very obviously? I, 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 I think that, it is that it, the danger of the corporate media is not a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. It's not that there will be three people saying exactly what must be read on the news the next night, although maybe that's possible. But the bigger, the bigger concern for me is the corporate media creates a media that is timid, a media that is afraid to go up against the powers that be because of the possible ramifications yes. for other parts of the corporate empire, and uh, an unwillingness to support investigative journalism and journalism that is by its nature iconoclastic so that you'll get You'll get, a, you'll get a media that is more of a cheerleader than a critic of society, and it's the role of the media to be the critic and not, not the cheerleader. Um, so there may be this sort of massive voter fraud in terms of the machines being reprogrammed, and that's possible. But in a way, what's more disturbing is, is, is how effectively public opinion is being manipulated and how effectively lies are being accepted as truths. Uh, at this point, one more question, please, and please pertaining to the points that we uh, refer to so far. You'll get a later, later chance, uh, uh, another chance later on. Okay. Yes. Um, first of all, I thought Fast Food Nation was a great book. I gave it away to almost all my friends. Uh, I've worked for a Dutch um, food retail and food service company for the last fi five years. Last two years were in New York City and your book was one of the inspirations for me to quit my job and to uh, <laughs> try to, seriously, to try to uh, create a new channel in the market for people to get their food and for farmers, honest farmers, to, you know, to get a chance to reach a larger public. Now, my question to you is, what will be the key success factor for me to succeed in doing this? So to put a channel next, you know, next to the, the Tysons and the, the IVPs of this world. Good question. Well, firstly, I really hope you find tremendous success Thank in you. this new line of work and, and hope it doesn't turn out to be a bad move. Uh, secondly, I think that the key is not only to be selling food to people, but trying to educate people about food at the same time. And it's remarkable in the States the more people know and understand about their food, uh, the less likely they are to buy the wrong food, the bad food, the fast food. The healthiest eaters in the United States are the educated upper middle class and wealthy. And there is a huge, huge expansion in the market for organic food, for, uh, for meats and for, for dairy products that have been produced through sustainable means without you know, growth hormones, antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera. So to the degree that what you're doing is connected to sustainable agriculture, locally produced agriculture, uh, uh, and, and to the degree that you are educating your consumers about what you're selling them mm -hmm. and what the other guys are selling them, uh, I think that's where, that's where the growth will come and that's where success will come. Certainly the companies that are doing that now in the United States 
are the ones business. that are growing the fastest. Yes. I mean, organics is the fastest growing segment of American agriculture. The good part about that is that the amount of land being devoted to organic production is greatly expanding. The bad part about that is some of the best organic companies are now being bought up by the big agribusiness companies. And you know, a lot of the underlying ethos is being lost, and it's just another kind of subsidiary that's growing quickly and profitable. So it, some of them are becoming victims of their own success. And also, I think I read it in one of your articles in Vanity Fair where you said that the USDA is relieving the standards for organic in the United States? They've tried to. Okay. They've tried to. They, they tried to uh, allow the sale of genetically modified organisms as organic which is, again, right out of the Orwellian yes. thing. Mm -hmm. This is an organic frankenfood. Um, <laughs> and they also tried to allow the sale of, of foods that were uh, produced with the use of sewage sludge as, as fertilizer, which would strike you as not being organic. But, but so far, the federal organic standard has stood the test. But, but one of the things that's very important now is that for organic not to be the only measure of a food. I mean, organic refers to you know, what was done to the soil, whether pesticides and herbicides were applied and, and how it was produced in that way, and I think that's very important. But there are other criteria, like what happened to the workers? You know, that there's a fair trade component. Uh, there's a local component. There's a component of was this produced by a family or was this produced by a gigantic multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. So organic is a very good standard, but it only goes so far. And there are other criteria opinion. that you should take into account when you think about the food you're going to sell. Thanks very much. Okay. Good um, Thank you. Thank you. Well, no, I'm, I have to be very strict because there's a huge uh, other uh, part. Very short. Promised? Eric, thanks for coming to Amsterdam. I was wondering if you've already got a title for your, new, for your new book on prisons, and are there subjects you intentionally avoid? Was that the shortest question to this evening? I think so. Um, I have a subtitle that I like, and I have a title that I'm not sure about. So the working title is Concrete and Barbed Wire, which is a Lucinda Williams song that I like but I'm just not sure about it as a title. Uh, the subtitle is How the Land of the Free Became a Nation Behind Bars. And that pretty much is the subject matter of the book. Uh, and there is something I really try to avoid writing Guns? about. Guns? No. No? No. Uh, my personal life. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. How the Land of the Free Became a Country Behind Bars. We got to that now. Mm -hmm. um, Growth, as you say, has occurred during the last 30 years. Why is that? Why, please explain. Why has it, has it grown so much in the last 30 years? Well, in, in writing about underground economies, I suggest that you know, underground economies generally get smaller and smaller as a country becomes more industrialized and economically advanced. You find enormous underground economies in third world nations, developing nations, mm -hmm. and in Soviet-style economies. Uh, but as they become more advanced, the underground is inefficient. The underground uh, becomes mainstream. What's happened in the United States and in some other Western countries over the last 25 or 30 years is a huge growth in the underground economy. And, and it reflects a society at odds with itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you do believe in Adam Smith, as these free marketers say they do, say they do. Uh -huh. uh, for them, uh, the marketplace is the fullest expression, literally, of God. Uh, and the invisible hand in the marketplace, which is Adam Smith's phrase, is the hand of God making sure that people's desires are matched by someone else producing the products that they want. So what's happened in the last 25 years is that some products that people want a great deal uh, aren't being satisfied by the mainstream economy. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the growth of the black market, and it's this contradiction between these free marketeers who say they want free markets except are willing to crack down and condemn and punish and imprison some people for certain commodities. Mm -hmm. And that's where, the, that's where the, the marijuana and the pornography fits in. Exactly, yeah. Uh, they will crack down and, and imprison people ruthlessly, 
Uh, but another aspect of the free market I look, la look at is the exploitation of illegal immigrants. And it's remarkable how the people exploiting illegal immigrants in this gigantic black market labor pool are not being given sentences of life without parole mm -hmm. uh, because they happen to be some of the biggest industries in the United States. So there are all these contradictions that you see when you look at the black market. And, and for me, what's interesting about it is what it tells you about the society, what it keeps hidden, what is under the table, and, uh, and in many ways, the, the hypocrisy. Now let's skip the, 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 the porn chapter for, for reasons of, of, of you know, shortness of time, although I will be eternally envious to you of for you having met Nina Hartley. <laughs> but, um, um, so let's get on to the marijuana and then to the prison. Yeah. Uh, um, just a short question. The, the odd thing is that marijuana is not only possibly the largest, but also the most profitable cash crop now or at the time of the writing of your book in the United States, that it is grown in the American heartland, which I had never, never. I mean, I was under the impression that it was grown in Mexico, in Hawaii, or in California. Uh, but also that the majority of the farmers, uh, uh, of the growers, are farmers that could have stepped out of that wonderful uh, American Gothic painting by, by uh, uh, Nan Wood Graham. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that's, that was a shocking experience for me to read. And it was very shocking for me. And it, that was when my whole interest in the black market really began, which was I was in Indiana, mm -hmm. in the middle of the American heartland, one of our chief corn growing states, and I was meeting with marijuana growers, and I was spending time with a, with a chief DEA agent conducting marijuana investigations, and I was realizing that extraordinary amounts of marijuana were being grown there, and that even though this was our, one of our chief corn producing states, in Indiana, by value, uh, marijuana may be the largest cash crop, and if not the largest, the second largest. But when you travel through Indiana, especially the rural Indiana where I was spending time, it looks like a landscape out of a Hallmark card. It looks like these small towns are out of the Frank Capra, Jimmy Stewart films of the 1930s and 1940s. And you know, I visited one farm where a marijuana crop worth millions of dollars had been produced, and it just seemed so incongruous. And I realized if there is a multi-million, perhaps billion dollar black market in Indiana, it's everywhere in America. I mean, you would, you would expect in it in New York America. City. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You would expect to be able to buy anything you want at any price under the table in New York. But for, for farmers to be earning a fortune, drug fortunes, off of you know, traditional American farms was mm -hmm. a shock. Mm -hmm. An even other, uh, other thing, and uh, I think a, a, a stronger word than odd is, is in place, is that, and now we get to where the, uh, the marijuana laws inter intersect with uh, the, next, the subject of your next book, is that in many places of the United States, you're better off uh, caught with a smoking gun in your hand, with, which, which you have just killed the person sitting next to mm -hmm. you, than with a roach. Well, it can be. In but the in sense the, you mentioned the example in, in, of Indiana. In Indiana, yeah. under state law, the yeah. typical convicted murderer would spend 11 years behind bars. But I wrote about a marijuana offender who had never spent a day in prison, had never been in jail, had never been convicted of any violent act, who got life without parole mm -hmm. uh, for his first marijuana offense. Because he didn't want to cooperate with... Because uh, he refused to yes. cooperate with the and, government. And, and now, that is not to say that everyone who gets busted for pot in the United States gets a life sentence. No. But what's interesting to me is the power of the government. And, and ultimately, this marijuana chapter isn't really about marijuana. It's about the rise of government power, the ability of the government to punish who it doesn't like, and especially the use of the drug laws as a way of enforcing a certain kind of conformity. I mean, it gets back to that other theme in Fast Food Nation about how America in the last 20 years has become this rigid conformist country. And the question that I asked myself in the for the marijuana uh, section was, how does a country come to punish someone more harshly 
for marijuana than for killing someone with a gun. And the answer has very little to do with the plant itself and everything to do with who smokes it. And the people who have traditionally smoked marijuana have been people that the mainstream fears or dislikes or in the case of the last 20 years really wants to put under its thumb. Uh, but so it's, it's the, the war on drugs isn't really a war on drugs. It's a war on nonconformists and it's a war on minorities because if you wanted to wage a war on drugs, a true war on dangerous drugs, you'd have to start prosecuting some pharmaceutical company executives. But and if you, I, I, I haven't seen I, I that can, happening. I, I, I buy the argument that you say it's a war on nonconformists, but not that if you say that it's, um, it's um, the trend towards conformity uh, uh, in the United States that's being uh, perpetuated by this. Why is it that the sons and daughters of senators and congressmen, uh, uh, albeit federal or, 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 or local, are never punished when they are caught uh, uh, selling uh, because, cocaine or marijuana? Because there are two legal systems. In the United States, but if, there you is want, the, there if you is, strive for conformity, the, then you want. Are you saying that that public officials should actually behave the way that they want other people to behave? I mean, there are two legal systems. I, there's I, a, there's I, a legal system for the poor, and then there's a legal system for those who have very good attorneys. And a better example of how the conformity works at the beginning of the 1980s, two percent, maybe three percent of the Fortune 200, 300 corporations required employees to take drug tests. Yes. Now it's 98%. Mm -hmm. That is not a test of whether you smoke a joint on the job mm -hmm. because the metabolites of marijuana can stay in yes. your bloodstream for days or weeks. This is a test if you are the sort of person who smokes pot. If you are the sort of person who smokes pot you cannot be employed by 98% of these Fortune 200 companies. During the 1960s, marijuana, a weed, a plant that grows wild in all 50 states became associated with a culture, with a counterculture. And the war on drugs has been a war on that counterculture and also on the hip hop culture of, of African American youth. And uh -huh. if you look again, at who has smoked pot traditionally in American society. At first, it was poor Mexican immigrants who were feared and despised. Then it was African American jazz musicians. And jazz in the 1920s was regarded with the same shock, horror that hip hop was in the 80s and 90s. Uh, then beatniks, then uh, hippies, then members of the hip hop community, and again and again, you see this plant being associated with minority groups and subcultures that the mainstream doesn't like. So, you know, the fact that uh, alcohol consumption is killing conservatively 100,000 Americans a year, uh, if marijuana killed 100,000 Americans a year, we would be burning pot growers at the stake. Mm -hmm. But so this, this if, if you think about it simply as a drug war, you're missing the cultural aspect of it. And the cultural aspect of it is crucial because in many ways, this is like a mass psychosis. You know, AIDS patients. Yeah, you compare it to the witch hunt, the well, McCarthy AIDS, witch hunt. Yeah. When AIDS patients and cancer patients face imprisonment for smoking and using a drug that is less toxic than aspirin, there's something besides pharmacology that's being used to determine the laws. Do you believe in, in medical purposes of marijuana? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know whether it is the wonder drug that some of its proponents claim, but I have spoken to sufferers of multiple sclerosis. I have spoken to paraplegics. As a matter of fact, I interviewed a paraplegic who had lost the use of his legs, had terrible, severe phantom pains in those legs, as many paraplegics do, who found marijuana to be much more effective for pain relief than taking opiates, which mm -hmm. completely messed up his head, which completely drugged him. 
And he was prosecuted for an ounce or two of pot in the back of his wheelchair, and he got life plus 16 years in prison. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is madness. I spoke to an AIDS patient who was smoking marijuana as an appetite stimulant. I mean, the same thing that gives normal stoners, the munchies, can literally save the life of an AIDS patient mm -hmm. by providing a, a strong appetite. And he was imprisoned, and his cellmate had strangled, the cellmate had strangled his girlfriend to death and had gotten a shorter sentence than he did for smoking pot as an AIDS patient. So this is not rational, scientific inquiry into the harmfulness mm -hmm. of a drug. And I am not, a, I'm not an advocate of smoking pot. I don't have a big pot leaf Neither poster up I, in no. my room. I don't think it's the sacred herb that will bring you no. in touch with God. If you think that, you know, I respect your opinion. But, but my interest in marijuana is looking at it uh, and looking at the war on drugs as a means of social control and as a means of the government intervening in the private lives and the personal lives of its citizens. It, let's be fair uh, that uh, this is not the domain of conservative Republicans. Uh, no. Being tough on drugs, uh, uh, under Clinton, many more offenders were incarcerated than under Ronald Reagan. I don't know what the picture looks like now. And you have a wonderful quote by the Republican mayor of uh, New York City, Mayor Blo oh, yeah. uh, Michael Bloomberg, yeah. Asked if he'd ever smoked pots, Michael Bloomberg, Republican mayor of New York City, replied, you bet I did and I enjoyed it. Yeah. Which is very different from what it Bill is. Clinton said, wasn't it? It is. <laughs> and, and some of the most outspoken critics of the war on drugs have been conservative Republicans who are true to their conservative beliefs. Yes. William F. Buckley, a very conservative uh, American magazine editor, actually wrote a very complimentary review of my book. Um, uh, George Shultz, former Secretary of State in the Reagan administration, Milton Friedman, conservative economist, true conservative believes in limited government and is afraid of the yes. power of the government. Yes. Uh, some liberal politicians have been absolutely appalling on the issue of uh, the war on drugs and also appalling when it comes to incarceration. In this book, I mentioned that more people were arrested for marijuana while Bill Clinton was president yes. than under any other president. Mm -hmm. In my next book, I will mention that more Americans were sent to prison during Bill Clinton's eight years than during any other presidency. And the liberals who have wanted to hold on to power or who have wanted to attain power have made this deal with the devil in order to look tough, in order to seem strong so as not to seem weak, they have supported the war on drugs, they have supported mandatory sentencing, and they have, they have supported sentencing rules that have filled American prisons with the poor and with the minorities who these liberals claim uh, to support. Well, let's, let's talk a bit more in depth about that because I think it's about time. Monique, can you give me a sign? When, okay. But wait, there's a lot, lot more we have to talk about. The number of drug offenders imprisoned uh, in America today at the time, of, or at the writing of your book, one-third of a million, close to 400,000, is larger than the number of all people imprisoned in, in the year 1970. About one in every six federal inmates in, in prison is in there for marijuana use or sale or whatever. And this is where it ties in, of course, with your next book, which is going to be about the prison crisis about the, 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 the well, the rise of, of the prison population is, is an understatement, uh, 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 I should say. Uh, please um, explain briefly what the book is going to be about, and then we'll have some more questions about it. Well, if you were to go back in time to the late 1960s, prisons were widely regarded throughout the United States as being obsolete. Prisons were regarded as a means of last resort, reserved really for recidivist, violent offenders. And the United States was in the process during the 1960s of closing prisons. Prisons were being shut, the prison population was shrinking, and there was a conservative Republican governor of California 
who proudly closed down prisons. What was his name? Ronald Reagan. What was it? We had not, we, that we have not, that this was not a one two. Yeah. I, I really didn't know. And so in 1970, there were about 200,000 Americans in prison. Today, there are 2.2 million. Yes. And no society in human history has ever put that many people in prison. Uh, other societies have had gulags. The Soviet Union had a gulag, which was slightly larger, but not that much larger. And you have to be a very wealthy society to build that many prison cells for that many people. I mean, this is expensive. Each one of those inmates is costing anywhere from 18000 to 90000 or $100,000 a year. So in writing this book, I'm almost imagining myself as a future historian, because I think this is one of the most extraordinary cultural events of the last 25 years in the United States. It's received remarkable little attention in the mainstream media, but it's incredible. Nobody has ever done this before. And if you look at who is in prison, I would be just fine with putting 2.2 million people in prison if they were murderers, rapists, child molesters, violent armed robbers, but they're not. And if you add up all the convicted killers and the convicted rapists and the convicted child molesters and the convicted armed robbers, now some of those armed robbers may not have intended to hurt anybody, but if you pull a gun on someone to rob them, the let's just throw are. that into the list. Yeah. If you add all of those up, you come up with about 350,000. And if you assume, well, there are some violent guys who got convicted on a drug charge, but they're bad guys, that means if you want to be generous, perhaps there are 500,000 people who are legitimately, deservedly locked up. And that leaves you 1.7 million people to think about. Who are they? Why are they behind bars? And why are we doing this? And that's what the book is about. You already hinted at a, a couple of the underlying reasons. Um, um, racism, uh, class justice. Are they, um, are those, um, let's say, uh, terms that you could throw in uh, with reason? Or is that just hypothetically speaking? Uh, you, you cannot write about prisons in America without looking at race and class as two of the central issues. Okay. And the way in which a white upper middle class person will be punished and a brown or, or dark skinned poor person will be punished for the same crime, there is enormous discrepancy. I, I don't have a conspiratorial view of history. I don't believe that this was a deliberately created system to destroy young black men and destroy young Latino men. But there's no question that's one of the consequences of this system. And when you look at who we are imprisoning, uh, the war on drugs is unavoidable because 70 to 80 percent of the people in prison are substance abusers. Mm -hmm. Now they may be, that, that figure you mentioned of one third are there for drug convictions. Yes. Uh, they may be there for theft, they may be there for robbery, they may be there for a variety of other crimes, to but they are substance their abusers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're substance abusers, the rate of illiteracy is enormous, uh, the rate of poverty is enormous, the overwhelming majority had annual incomes below ten or twelve thousand dollars a year before they were imprisoned. The rate of mental illness is extraordinary. There are something like 350, 375,000 seriously, mentally ill inmates. These are people who 30 years ago would have been in mental hospitals, but we shut down our mental hospitals and deinstitutionalized mental patients. Well, so instead of being under medical care, they are here. wandering around in prison. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the prisons of America, you are looking at the underclass. You are looking at the bottom of society. And this is how we have decided to treat the people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Not to educate them, not to provide drug treatment, 
not to provide mental health counseling, but to provide punishment. Very expensive, I would argue, illogical, counterproductive punishment. And this is the biggest machine for punishment built in mankind's history. If you see these prisons as these interconnecting buildings and, and systems, it is, a, it, is a, it is a vast, intricate system of punishment. You um, mentioned, it, I don't know if it was in the, in, no, it was not in the book because you have not written it yet. <laughs> it was in one of the interviews and one of the articles that I, yeah. that I read uh, uh, um, uh, that one of the myths uh, connected with locking people up is that it deters people from uh, criminal behavior. Uh, and I think you say there that no, it helps them become better criminals. And um, I had the experience <coughs> once of being in, uh, on death row in, in Livingston in Texas mm. and talking to uh, one of the inmates who's going to die. Uh, and he showed me all, all the tattoos on his, on his body that, as he said from a previous conviction, uh, he, he needed to, uh, to comply with being tattooed in order to become a member of one of these secret societies inside jail that help keep you alive. Yeah. There is no way of not becoming more racist, no, uh, more violent, more alienated from the rest of society if you want to survive in, in, in prison. If you are six foot eight and really strong and muscular, and know how to fight, uh, you don't need to join a prison gang. Mm -hmm. uh, but most other inmates need, and this is particularly in the maximum and medium security facilities, you need some sort of gang affiliation yes. for protection. These gangs are generally along racial lines, and these prisons are not only machines of punishment, they are machines for creating hatred, they have served as recruiting centers yes. for the gangs. The Los Angeles Bloods and Crips, which were a, a Southern California phenomena, have become a national phenomena. The neo-Nazi gangs have become national phenomena. Um, these are schools of crime, schools of dysfunction. And one of the great lies and one of the great myths that has been sold to the American people is that we are taking bad guys, locking them up, and throwing away the key. Mm -hmm. And Americans have supported prison construction on that basis. I personally support incarceration very strongly. I have met quite a few people. That you wouldn't want to like to meet here on the street. That I'd really rather not meet after tonight. <laughs> um, but that I feel I sleep soundly at night knowing that they are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. They deserve to be incarcerated. There are certain people who surrender their right to live in free society. Mm -hmm. I have no qualm about that. But if you're going to lock people up, you should either keep them or you should try to rehabilitate them. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't realize is the typical American prisoner is spending two and a half years in prison and then being released. And what happens to that person during those two and a half years is significant. You can teach them how to read or give them drug treatment, or you can allow them to be ruled by other inmates in a culture in which the strong prevail and the weak suffer, and that's what we're doing. So instead of creating this huge, tall wall to protect us from the bad guys, we have constructed, for an annual cost of about 40, 45 billion dollars a year, a huge, remarkably efficient revolving door in which Dysfunctional people go in, are abused, continue to take drugs, are released, drug addicted, commit more crimes, go back in and in and out. I mean, the typical inmate who's released is rearrested within uh, three years. I think two thirds of them are rearrested within mm -hmm. three years. So this is a this is a Kafkaesque system, uh, and I'm optimistic. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Are you still optimistic in view of I the am. fact that more and more prisons are getting privatized? Uh, I am. And the reason I'm optimistic, and the Bush administration is 
building more prisons, is privatizing more prisons. The reason I'm optimistic about the prison uh, boom is not because it's morally wrong, not because it's ethically wrong, not because the American people are suddenly going to wake up full of compassion and pity for the weak and the poor, but because this system is so expensive, it's not sustainable. And the alternatives to this system are much less expensive. And at the state level, at the state level, but are you the talking about States, the private prisons now? The, uh, no, 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 no. I'm oh, talking oh, oh, about, oh, oh, oh. you know, drug treatment, mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of alternatives to incarceration, uh, halfway houses, mental health facilities. States are realizing that these prisons are just too expensive. The huge prison growth is occurring in the federal system. But if you look at the 2.2 million people who are behind bars, I think it's 100 and maybe 150,000 are in the federal system. So yes. a large amount of growth is occurring in a very small part of the prison system. Is the uh, potential for uh, abuse, corruption, uh, uh, let's not forget incompetence, higher in private prisons? Well, there are some private prisons that are actually nicer than some state prisons. And that's more a sign of how bad some state prisons yes. are. There are some state prisons, and I said this to someone the other day, that I was at a prison recently that if it were a zoo, it would be shut down immediately. The Humane Society would not allow giraffes and chimpanzees to be housed, <laughs> seriously, like human beings are being housed in some of these prisons. Some of the private prisons are newer, and they are not overcrowded, and you might actually have a better experience as an inmate at some private prisons than at some state prisons. But yet their bottom line is they have to make a profit. But the bottom line is they have an economic incentive to have as many inmates as possible, yes, and to keep them as long as possible. Yes. The economics of the private prison industry are almost identical to that of the hotel industry. Once the staff has showed up for work, the more crowded the rooms, the more profitable exactly. the place. So it's a self-perpetuating so mechanism. It's one of the it worst needs prisoners. Yes. It's one of the worst <laughs> ideas of the last 25 years. Right up there with a McNugget. I mean, this is just <laughs> So it's just not a good idea. And the countries that are following the American example by adopting private prisons do so at their own peril because it introduces a level of potential corruption that is extraordinary. And uh, not only do these companies have a vested economic interest in having more inmates for longer, but they have a vested economic interest in paying government officials and paying legislators to pass new laws to guarantee that there will be more inmates. And you don't want that economic incentive mm -hmm. in society. So that's why there really is uh, talk of a, a prison industrial complex in the United the States. The uh, state of California, just one statistic that I took from a book from John Didion, of Do, uh, John Didion. Uh, the state of California alone spends more on prisons now than on education. In the state of California, there are four times as many African-American men in prison as there are at universities. And California has a wonderful state university system, but four times the number of young African-American men are getting their education in a different system. And these prisons are an educational system, they are, yes. but of a, of a very different kind. Time for, for two more questions from the floor, please. Three, okay, one. Um, just about Fast Food Nation. I was wondering, you were saying um, about PETA that you thought they should support also the workers in the, uh, the uh, meatpacking plants, but um, what do you expect from an, uh, from, an animal, uh, from an animal organization that they really help the humans? Because you have like a dozen of organizations already which help the humans who are not as benefit, who are not as lucky to be born here uh, or be born in Mexico or something. So why do you really want to um, inspire PETA to also invest in the people in the meat bank plans? Well, I, I admire some of the success that PETA has had. 
Uh, PETA threatened a nationwide boycott and demonstrations at McDonald's in order to get McDonald's. McDonald's is the biggest purchaser of beef in the United States. So they wanted McDonald's to tell its meatpacking suppliers to treat the cattle more humanely in the slaughterhouse. And I saw terrible abuse of cattle going on in the slaughterhouse. Um, there have been many, many instances of cattle being dismembered while still conscious. So PETA said to McDonald's, as the biggest purchaser of beef, you're responsible for what happens to these animals. Or we're going to boycott you, and we're going to demonstrate, and we're going to make your life very difficult. And McDonald's told its meatpacking suppliers to change how it slaughters cattle, to be much more careful, to be much more conscious, and much more humane. And within a few weeks, the meatpacking industry began fundamental changes in how they treat cattle. Now, PETA, which is effective in a way that the labor unions right now are not at all in the United States, could have said, and by the way, those workers in the plants, we don't want to see them injured also. And I think that if PETA had said they would stage nationwide demonstrations against McDonald's, McDonald's, if McDonald's wanted to improve the conditions in America's meatpacking plants for the workers, it would be even easier, much easier, than changing the slaughter practices. Because literally, each one of these slaughterhouses has a dial or button that would slow down the production line. Mm -hmm. And those production lines could be slowed down in a day. And there is a direct correlation between the speed of production, and studies have been coming out recently, the speed of production and the rate of injury. So, you know, I, I think it's admirable the work that's done on behalf of animal rights, but I just wish that instead of having all of these separate lobbying groups, that there was a, there was a sensibility that saw that all these things are connected. That the same company that is abusing animals is totally, completely destroying the environment. I mean, the number one source of water pollution in the United States right now are these gigantic factory farms. And they're also exploiting their workers. And all these things are connected. So if you want a genuine movement to oppose all of these unethical practices, you can't fragment it. You have to just say, all of this is bad. So that's my, that's my issue with the animal okay, rights. OK, but movement. it's not really the well, responsibility for PETA itself to um, improve the working conditions for the, for the workers in the factory because, well, you could say it as the workers are also committing the crimes, crimes against the animals. So you could have the... Uh, you, you could make that argument, but actually yeah. PETA does not make that argument. And PETA does not call for the, shut, for the closing of these slaughterhouses. And, um, uh, but you could, I mean, I think it's very valid to make the argument that you shouldn't be killing any animals at all which I think is what you're making, the argument that you're making. Well, I think so your question has been answered. Yeah, okay. okay. okay and, and one or more, one or, what, one or two, yes. You and, and you are the last one, yes. Um, I'm a social worker in the US. Louder, please. Oh, sorry. I'm a social worker in the US and I'm still studying in the area. But I've learned from, a, I've had professors who have been in prison. I have, uh, I live near Baltimore. And a lot of the, one of the big problems I've noticed with our prison system is we actually create it to be a good place to be. You go there, you have a bed, you have food, you have health care, detox, um, re rehab classes, group lessons, everything. You can get your high school and college diploma. And then we, you're released and nobody will hire you because you have a prison record and you have no place to live. You're constantly looked down upon by even, even the poor communities. And then we have children who are coming up and saying, I want to join my father in prison, or what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm going to be in prison. We're creating prison to be a good place to be. How are we, how are we going to change that? The fact that anyone can consider prison a good place to be is a sign of how bad it is where they're coming from. There are some prisons that are really well run, that have all kinds of programs, 
that are clean and, 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 and have a feeling of safety to them. And there are absolutely some inmates who find it easier to be in prison. Mm -hmm. Prison is the only place where there is any order, where there is any schedule, where there are regular meals, where there's access to health care. And many inmates who are released not only find it difficult to find a job, but find it difficult to make choices. When you are in prison, all the choices just about are made for you. And they're, it's almost like, uh, like they're, they're juvenilized by prison. So there's no question that for some people, prison is an attractive alternative. But to me, that's a terrible indictment of the society on the outside, that anyone uh, would need to go to prison to get health care. Because if you saw the health care in prison, some of it really isn't that good. It's better than the but, but, but ultimately, the point, the bigger point, and a lot of what my book is going to be about, is there was a quote by Winston Churchill, and Churchill took his quote from Dostoevsky, and I'm going to mangle it, but simply it is, show me your prisons, and I'll tell you everything you need to know about your society. I think it's true. And that's why it's really important to look at what's happening in these prisons. Thank you. Last question, definitely last. I promise I'll be else, very, please, very can quick. You make your comments um, later, or maybe if you, you can ask your question privately. I will. I'll be very, very quick. I want to come back to um, the Reefer Madness book, though we, we went into books you had yet to write. And, and the actual chapter is A Tax Case and Nothing More. In, in, in at one point you note that one of the magistrates had noted this particular quote, denying a defendant the right to determine whether the United States government has complied with an international treaty in seeking evidence against him is inconsistent with the basic tenets of our jurisprudence. Well, it would seem to me that at this stage in international law and international dealings, the United States government has done all it can to step over that. And I'm wondering if you could possibly give me some, some of your thoughts with regards to that quote and perhaps uh, the Iraqi situation or even, even just dealing with things like uh, the EU and the UN. I'm sorry, what, what was the... Even, even just dealing with things like the EU and the UN or, or things like um, the United States contention that if uh, an American citizen was uh, arrested in Holland, mm -hmm. they had the right to actually send in the army to rescue an American, an American citizen who had been arrested here. The, the, well, there, there are, the, the Hague Invasion Act. Yeah, well, there, there, there are two issues. And one is international law and the principles embodied by international law. And unfortunately, there are violations of basic human rights recognized by international law occurring in the United States every day. And you don't need to go to the prisons to see them. You just need to go to meatpacking communities. And a very good group, Human Rights Watch, issued a report this year on the American meatpacking industry. It's the first time they've studied a US industry. And they found widespread violations of basic international human rights, basic rights uh, in the meatpacking industry. So that's one issue, violation of human rights. The other issue then, and this is a very, very contentious issue in the United States, is who should be responsible for enforcing those human rights? And the United States is, is not going to abide by uh, the International Criminal Court in The Hague and the United States is against very many international treaties that might subject its soldiers, uh, its generals, uh, its, its administration, its mm -hmm. diplomats to prosecution. Um, it is complicated, however, and it's especially complicated when you look at the United Nations. And in theory, I am a huge supporter of the United Nations. And when you look at some of the countries that have been empowered uh, on the issue of human rights, um, those have been countries that have not always been the greatest supporters of human rights. So the, the, the international human rights regime 
is something that I think would be wonderful and needs to be perfected, uh, but the basic international law and the, 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 the requirements of international law are clear and incontrovertible whether you argue about who should enforce them. Um, does that answer your question? I think it does. <laughs> I have a final question, yeah. uh, Eric. Um, um, that'll wrap it up. Uh, what has all of this, um, writing these two books, three books, um, the research under the most uh, unsavory of circumstances and uh, living among the most uh, disenfranchised uh, people done to you personally? Um, it's made me feel grateful for the life and the privileges that I've had. It's made me, I hope, less likely to whine about trivia compared to what other people um, are experiencing, but it's also maybe more profoundly given me a visceral connection to and understanding of people who couldn't be more different. And in that sense, uh, it has deflated, and some people might argue, but I think it has greatly deflated my ego <laughs> because I have been amongst some of the poorest and most despised people in the United States, and it has left me with a feeling of there but for the grace of God go I, and the, the line between privilege and disaster is very fragile, and it's given me much less tolerance for pompous, arrogant, clueless people. Doesn't that provide a wonderful coda? Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm sorry that we have to break up because I think it was a wonderful evening with uh, a lot of um, openness. And thank you, Eric, for uh, bringing the song, giving us the song before the singer. I think you're a remarkable uh, person, and I, uh, I envy your... Uh, Courage. Um, thank you, Jan, for giving the introduction, introduction and putting out the right questions. Thank you all for coming and uh, asking the questions and coming. Eric told me that he will sign his books. I think somewhere on the stage there will be something provided to make that happen. And then you are still welcome to ask some more questions personally when you have your book signed. Thank you very much for, very much for coming. There's uh, one announcement to make. Uh, the John Adams Institute has more lectures coming up tomorrow already, the 7th of October, with Tom Wolfe. Next week, the 12th of October, we have something to do with the Amsterdam China Festival. We do something with Ian Burema and Jan van der Putten on the changing of superpowers, question mark, China or America. On the 13th of October, also in Amsterdam, there's an evening about <laughs> uh, Chinese hey, poets and again, also no. some dissidents <laughs> moving from Beijing to, to uh, New York. But also on the same evening, on the 13th of October, there yes. is another show in The Hague. John Adams Institute is also going to The Hague. I'm quite proud. And Jan is going to interview Jan Jane Fonda. So if you want to go there, it's on the 13th of October in The Hague. That's it for now. It's only next week and this week. So I hope to see you again.